Welcome to Clarity Conversations. I'm Alicia Mayo, the executive producer. I'm here today to talk about what's going on in our world. We've got a lot happening in terms of socio-political history. Joining me today to analyze this time in our history is scholar and political scientist, Dr. James Taylor. He's professor of politics at the University of San Francisco. He's the author of two books, Black Nationalism in the United States and California Black Politics. Professor Taylor is also former chair of the Department of Politics at USF, former president of the National Conference of Black Political Scientists, and the former chair of the American Political Science Association. He is also a political correspondent for C-SPAN, CNN, and in my, in my former stomping grounds, Cron for television, the local. <laughs> news leader. <laughs> I had to add that. Thank you so much, Professor Taylor, for joining me for this talk. Let's first uh, talk about political rights of police, the constitutional rights of police to treat people, particularly Black people, the way they have been. Is there some constitutional law that is creating uh, uh, this, this idea or this feeling that police police officers have uh, that makes them feel like they have the right to shoot and kill people? Nowhere in the Constitution are police recognized at all. Um, uh, the powers of the state to create courts and things of that sort are in place, but the police in and of themselves are not recognized. In fact, the people in the Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, Sixth Amendment, Eighth Amendment, uh, and more, Fourteenth Amendment, are all given protections against state power and the, the police powers. So if anyone gets protections, it's the whole Bill of Rights that are really are a Bill of Liberties. They should be called the Bill of Liberties because it's more of liberties rather than rights, which are negative rights or protections against the state as opposed to affirmative rights given to you as a citizen. So if you read the Bill of Rights, it says Congress shall make no law. The word no turns all of that body of law behind it into negative rights. So we have certain legal protections against state power. And so if anyone has rights in the Constitution, it would be the people. The people are supposed to be secure in the houses in the Fourth Amendment, papers, persons, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. But you have a Supreme Court that effectively has allowed the, court, that, the Fourth Amendment to be interpreted in such a way that Breonna Taylor is dead. It's the Supreme Court that everybody should be aimed at. Everyone should be focused more on the police. They should be focused on the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court basically allows it. The Supreme Court uh, provides the legal pretext to the racism and the violence that we see in the streets because the Supreme Court basically give law enforcement officers a kind of sovereign immunity in the way we see often given to diplomats in terms of diplomatic immunity, but I think People in the a democracy shouldn't even allow for limited or even um, any kind of immunity for law enforcement. Because if the state can give immunity to itself, then it says the state is the final arbiter in society. But in America, the people are supposed to be the final thing. And so the people, not the state, are supposed the to have state? the final say. I'm following you here, and I think um, that brings me to the Constitutional Bill of Rights for Police Officers. Is that something that was created by the state as well? Yes, and this is largely a, a reaction to the Black Lives Matter movement, the Blue Lives Matter movement. Um, you know, law enforcement it basically has tried to create a, the idea that they are a race. Kid you not. They even have hate crimes now that direct uh, under Obama. Or under Obama, uh, federal law enforcement now can be victims of hate crimes. In fact, two days ago, some young people were charged with hate crimes for doing something to officers that was you know, superficial, uh, but they were being charged with hate crimes. So law enforcement has gotten itself in America in such a corner that it's like a child crying to the society, begging it to be treated fairly after it's abused its brothers and sisters all around it. It's like the bad child in the family who's beating everybody up and the parents have come in to check it and now they want everybody to feel sorry for them for being the abusive child and getting caught. That's what we're seeing right now. And law enforcement needs to fix itself and it also needs to be fixed um, externally. And that's, that's where I think it is. And so where we are right now is in a, a, a important transition, of, I think, towards a new era of police reform. But we're just at the very, very beginning. I mean, we're two weeks in, in terms of real reaction to the recent insurgency 
that um, has so many different reforms uh, being put in place around the country. Right. So in your opinion, um, in, in, in a historical perspective, what do you think uh, has happened with police reform and, or police relations in terms of society from uh, it, it, just on a historical perspective, in your opinion? Yeah, yeah American policing, unfortunately, evolves in, in three different areas in the country in three different ways. In the Northeast, it was largely it, policing grows out of the watchman system in New England, of the British system. In fact, it was the British uh, police that shot um, a Christmas addicts to you know, launch off the, the American Revolution five years later. Um, but that's where the American policing system evolves out of the British system, first in Boston, New England. And that's where the first police department in America is and was considered the best in the world. And then New York came and New York was considered corrupt. And then you had like Chicago and other cities. And then finally the West Coast cities like Arizona, Phoenix, uh, LA, you know, the West Coast cities emerged. Their policing is all more recent. But most people make a mistake and say policing started out of the slave patrols. That's only regionally true in the South. That's not in the North. There, were, there weren't slaves in the North at this point. They came up to the North to hunt of fugitives, absolutely, especially in Massachusetts. But be clear that these are very different formations of law enforcement. So people need to be clear. Policing starts out of slave patrols only in the South. In the Northeast, they evolved out of the British watchman system, which focused mostly on humanitarian issues of children and animals being lost. So policing in the Northeast really did cut its teeth being social workers, and maybe they need to go back to that. And then on the West Coast here, more recently in the 1850s, you have what they call the vigilante committees. And the vigilantes mm -hmm. are what uh, out of the commie, uh, de uh, commie, uh, the deputies, commie, uh, comitas, deputies, or uh, um, deputies, comitatus, I'm saying it wrong. Um, but uh, out of this whole notion of deputizing the public, um, uh, the, the vigilantes, the, the San Francisco Vigilance Committee was the most violent of all. So in all the country where these vigilance committees were forming, because there were no deputies, no court systems, and people deputized the local men within a certain radius, the most vicious of them in history was the San Francisco Vigilance Committee. And, and, and what's, what's coincidental in all of this is everybody was Irish. In the West Coast, they were Irish. In the South, they were Protestant Irish. And in the Northeast, they were Catholic Irish, the Kennedy type, you know, Irish. And, and if you think about law enforcement and policing, there's scholarship that demonstrates that the first tensions between policing and the black community in 1866, the year after abolition, um, was a race riot in Memphis, Tennessee, by, led by the Irish law, uh, police of Memphis Police Department, the same police department that was implicated in murdering Martin Luther King in that same city in 1968. So Memphis is where the first police on black race riot happens, but the scholarship shows underneath the uniforms was nothing but Irish racism at, aimed at black folk. And that's the history of policing that most people don't want to talk about. Much of it has to do with the Irish who themselves had been, in fact, the word Irish is the N word for white people. And this is what people don't realize. The Irish came to America and became hyper Americans. And if you look at who the most hostile people are politically to black political issues today, Bill O'Reilly, William F. Buckley, Ronald Reagan, Megyn Kelly, Rupert Murdoch, Sean Hannity. There's this whole, Pat, Pat Buchanan, oh my Lord. There's like a long list of vicious anti-Black racism amongst the Irish in American politics in the, in the Republican Party. But that only came after Kennedy. Before that, a lot of that tension was located in cities like Chicago, New York, Roxbury and Boston, where it was, seemed to be police versus black, but it was Irish police versus black. And this is a whole nother complicated dynamic between blacks and the Irish because the Irish sold black people out a long time ago when mm. they were still not even considered white. They decided to sell black mm. folk out and policing is the most recent sellout. You just and struck people, her. And most you people just, don't know that. I agree with you on that. Uh, you just struck a personal uh, nerve here because in fact I have a large percentage of Irish blood in me and that to me speaks about a love-hate relationship yeah. you know that we can even look to within our own black community or within our our uh, micro communities where we have not treated each other right right, right. 
So right. yeah, we'll come back to that subject on, a, on another time, but yeah. thank you so much for bringing that up because yeah. that brings a historical uh, perspective into uh, our, uh, our, our, our data banks, our, our personal data banks that we can all research on our own. So thank you for that, Professor. What about uh, now these reforms, the police reforms, uh, have they worked? the more recent reforms under the Obama administration uh, that were, you know, kind of developed around 2015, 2016, have, yeah. have, how yeah. they worked? No, no, thank you. I was actually on the committee in San Francisco uh, as a part of the re community uh, angle to the reforms of the Obama Department of Justice where it found 282 problems with the, um, with the uh, San Francisco Police Department and the department created all of these different committees to address all of these different issues. In San Francisco, unfortunately, the reform uh, all was um, cold blanketed all of a sudden because of a scandal over in San Francisco related to the Jeff Adachi case that blew everything uh, that uh, SFPD was trying to do in terms of uh, complying with the Obama uh, Justice Department findings out the water. And the unfortunate timing was as soon as that happened, Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions came in, refusing to enforce the consent decrees, which basically required local police departments like Ferguson and Baltimore and San Francisco and LAPD to comply with federal observers who can you know, referee their policing. And that was in place. What's really important to know is 92 after the LA riots until about 2008 when Oscar Grant is killed, you generally have a era of police reform. Of course, there are, some, there are a number of incidents we can point to, um, and I'm sure there's research that will show the pattern of shootings in between this period, but none of them got our attention like a Trayvon or a Tamir Rice or, um, you know, or a Oscar Grant, mainly because they were not caught on video. And that's the key. The technology is important for understanding the modern era because what distinguishes now from, say, Sean Bell in New York being shot 41 times or Amadou Diallo, or, or, or Luima is the video captured. So Oscar is the first captured, and that um, marks off, I think, an important, um, an important, you know, time period uh, for understanding this entire struggle, this entire movement. It's been going on, and it has, I think, um, led to people losing faith in the claims to reform because law enforcement reformed itself so well between Rodney King and Oscar Grant, with the exception of a few well-known incidents, but they weren't captured and they didn't get a mass grassroots reaction or even a media reaction because they weren't captured. Oscar was the first captured on video. We've seen others like Tamir Rice and others, um, the young brother of, um, in Cleveland who was at the, um, the Walmart shopping and, and playing with the toy gun section, uh, he was shot. We saw that on video. So the technology, the video is important to understand why this time era is different than say, that, you know, 2005, seven, going backwards. Um, and what we learn is even with Rodney King, seeing something on video that seems to be self-evident, law enforcement and their lawyers have found ways to manipulate mm. every movement of law enforcement in an encounter in such a way that they try to define every movement as compliant with uh, policy. Um, and black folk and many white folk, 800 white folk were, were arrested in 92 in LA. Um, said no. In fact, LA, the white people started the riot in LA in 92 in Simi Valley. I was there. In Simi Valley, white folks started throwing rocks at the kids first, and then it became a black riot after, but, but nobody remembers that. But my point is, in between, say, the LA riot reforms, police were doing well. They got out this mentality of the war on drugs warrior and put that cop to death. They did. And then they were trying to revive a new type of policing called guardian. So they were guardians of the community, defenders of the community, not offenders, not warriors attacking, but guardians protecting. And, and that was up under the Rodney King era reforms at the local level in, in PDs across the country. The general tenor of policing, they had, they had reformed themselves. And that's why I think they have to do it again. But what happens is once Oscar Grant happens, after that, you end up with, you know, Mario Woods, Alex Nieto, uh, 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 young Andy Lopez over in Santa Rosa, and then on and on and on. And then we're seeing more and more young people, men and women, walking to the, you know, walking to be shot or, you know, or having been shot on our social media loops. And so yeah. what we are, have been able to determine 
is all of the reform efforts during that time period, did, they were effective. But after Obama's uh, attempts to implement reforms and Eric Holder, in addition to what had been done in the immediate Rodney King period, that was a high point of policing. And we just all don't realize it. It was a high point of policing in America. And then after, and again, I'm not blaming Donald Trump. What happened, it starts happening on Obama. And I think it's racism. To be clear, I think that there was a sudden spike in police killings of blacks during Obama's second term. So I think they were doing it intentionally racistly as a part of a general racist backlash at the law enforcement level, absolutely. But I'm not blaming that on Trump. Trump is an effect, he's a part of that. And then he got in Suffolk County in Long Island and agitated it by telling law enforcement, disregard everything they told you before. When you get him in the car, punch, you know, push him in the head. Don't be so, don't be so nice, he said. So when the president said that, he gave all of the uh, un, untrained, poorly trained, um, uh, maverick law enforcement officers, you know, free reign to, yeah. to be violent. So, so now we're on the tip, the tip end of the Donald era, the Donald Trump era of policing. And right. again, I'm not blaming him for it. I'm saying a lot of this started with Obama, but it was still the racism about Obama. And this is yeah. the racism about Obama, the modern killings. And so is Trump. So it's all in the same bag as a reaction to the first black president. And that does not mean that I'm saying Obama's policies were black progressive because they weren't. It's just the idea that a black man, even Henry Louis Gates, who is hardly a black militant or a nationalist said recently mm -hmm. that white America seems to have lost something by having a black family in the, in the, in the White House. And it's, it did something to them, many of them psychologically. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, yeah. we see many of their children now on the front lines of this of protest and civil disobedience. So something very beautiful is happening right now. Yeah, I think it sounds like the, those children, and, and again, looking back at those personal family relationships, my, micro relationships within a community, within a family, where people are looking eye to eye, face to face, finally facing these issues that are affecting real lives. I think their children saw the change, the positive changes that came as they were becoming young adults, like you said, during that reform period. And then to see it quickly reverse yeah. right before their eyes yeah. is shocking. Yeah. And they've gotten out into the streets to protest, which is great. Okay, so now from, the, from that, what kind of reforms do you think must happen and continue to happen? Uh, and thank God we have the example of uh, the Obama era. No, thank you. I think, I think law enforcement itself should reform itself. That's how it has to happen. They have to do it internally. I've worked with the police. I see how they work. We can't do it on the outside. There's this whole, it's almost like a cult, um, mm -hmm. the way law enforcement operates. I don't mean to be derisive, but that's the pressure of membership to comply with the, uh, bl the blue line. And that I think is a real problem uh, that has to be done. And the revolution has to begin from within. And there are people with, from within, men, women, gay and straight, black and white, Native American, I've seen them, uh, late Asian, they will do the work if the public keeps creating this crisis. The people have to stay in the streets and keep the mess going so that the good people in the bureaucracy can get the power within the bureaucracy. What we're doing in the streets and what our young people are doing in the streets is giving capital to people who've been on the outside trying to get police to be right and do right for 10, 15, 20, well, you know, for this time yeah. period, you know, you know, since it's had this downturn. So, so really what I'm thinking about is, this might be like tangent, but I'll be quick. In 1941, FDR told uh, Asa Philip Randolph, if you want me to make change, go out and make me do it. FDR, the president, told the black movement leader, go out and create the, the environment, the milieu, the crisis. Go out and create the, the, the protests in the streets so then I can do something. And that's what I think uh, we have to understand is potential here is that, um, you know, this can be a, a great opportunity in, in that way. And so if it doesn't happen, what do you imagine it can be like? I mean, it, realistically. Yeah, if think, the reform think, does not yeah. happen and Donald Trump is reelected for some yeah, strange the reason. The problem is that we live in a large country with four, and we're headed to 400 million people. We're technically the last census, 310 million. But by the time we get to 2065, 
2075, the American public is supposed to be 400 million. The only group that's not growing is whites. Everybody else is exploding. Whites are actually dying in most of America. And that's scary. 33 out of 50 states right now, as we speak, not including the 130 a day that are dying from the opioid crisis. Um, uh, that's not even added to that. Or the COVID uh, uh, emergency, which is adds that, you know, it makes it even more. So, so, you know, in that sense, you know, the white population, I think, is generally in crisis in America. And what we're seeing is a general reaction to it in terms of our politics. And then the question is, where do we go from here? I think you will see reforms from within law enforcement, really good ones. But again, they can only go so far as the people in the streets give them capital in the, in the, in the chambers and in the offices and in the PDs of America where people want to change. There's 18,000 police departments, one and a half million cops in America. There's no way you're gonna get them all to do anything once, but you can get a general era of reform like you had between the Rodney King and Oscar Grant killings. Right between there, there are key murders of blacks all over the country, again, but it, it, it didn't spawn a black movement reaction like the Oscar Grant and um, uh, you know, Mario Woods and other locals did that spawned Black Lives Matter here. That's why you can't start all over America. You start in Oakland first, because that's where Alicia Garza and Black Lives Matter is tweeted from. And that's where um, uh, Kaepernick is launching his protest from, from what's happening in Oakland and in San yeah. Francisco. And then they're seeing stuff on TV, but the, but the movements that they were reacting to were local people here on the ground who organized to support those families. Including Stefan Clark in Sacramento. I can't forget right. Stefan. Right. Stefan Clark, that's right, in Sacramento, more, mm -hmm. most recently, actually, uh, sadly. Um, mm -hmm. And that was quite a tumult uh, up in Sacramento, and the community there is still organized. I think, Alicia, it's really important to understand that whenever these incidents happen, m local movements form around that family and those people for justice. And that's, yeah. the, that's kind of the real movement of, yeah. structure right now of the black movement not like the old time when king was the prophetic messiah um right. it's more organic from the bottom up and we're seeing even with the violence that's not something that black elites will tolerate right or support but the young mm -hmm. people said the only way we're going to get america's attention is to set you know a, a police department on fire you know the headquarters in minneapolis when that police department uh, station, substation caught on fire, the symbolism of it was that we no longer respect your authority, so now you have to use your power. Much like parents, when our children, you know, don't respect our authority, what do we do? We resort to power. Get over here right now. And that's law enforcement. They've lost their authority, the respect we had for the badge, those of us that, that had any respect for it. Um, but now they resort to trying to beat it into us. And I think it, it was a fatal decision. I think the black movement should commend itself. It has done a wonderful job of agitating, of bringing these issues to bear. They have America talking seriously about reparations. In my lifetime, I'm old enough to remember it was not a non-starter with black, black folk. Now we got 30% white people uh, supporting the idea and that is an all time high. And other folk will look at it and say, whoa, only 30% 30 30 white support it. Well, a political scientist like me says, I remember when it was 9%. So the fact that it's 30% in one lifetime, keep on moving, because it's coming if you keep agitating. And last night, I was all over the news and today suggesting that we need to politicize Juneteenth and get behind it for a national holiday. That's what I mean by politicize it, in the same way we did for um, the Martin Luther King birthday. We need to, at the, we need to form a decade-long Black movement beginning now agitating for a Juneteenth holiday to officially commemorate the end of slavery in America because nothing else we have on paper, not the Emancipation Proclamation or Gettysburg Address, acknowledge the humanity of blacks or the right of them to move on after slavery. Lincoln owed us a different kind of statement after the Emancipation Proclamation. That was a military uh, command or uh, uh, that was a executive order. He owed us an affirmative speech that should be recorded for all history, that talks about the importance of African-American people in America's history and what America owes it permanently for the permanent injury it put on black people. America can never, ever, 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 ever pay for its sin against black people. And we are always the proof that they are not who they say they are. And therefore they must pay reparations permanently from now on. And anybody talking to you about checks is an ignorant person. What I mean by reparations is fundamentally the American government declares a cease 
a, a cease war, a cease battle, a, 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 a detente, an end to war, the 400 year long war that the American state has been at with black America since they brought them here in chains. And I know you might think that's exaggerated, but think about oh, yeah. it. Name one police department in America that is black, that polices white people. Not one. I thought Arlington, Virginia was the one place. I look at that data recently, and that's not even accurate anymore. So white people don't know what it's like to have non-whites policing them. Black people have only lived with non, non mainly with non-blacks um, policing them for most of their history. And what people don't know is policing in America grows up with black folk moving into the cities around the same time in the 1860s as soon as we get free law enforcement is maturing in america and it's training itself mainly on the irish uh, who were poor amongst the irish law enforcement and amongst the italians but always amongst us always the black the negro has always been the enemy of the american law enforcement establishment and i'm not an extremist i work with sfpd on two committees i'm just telling you what i know as a scholar this is a fact this is not hyperbole john brown said that slavery was a condition of war and going into africa taking people was an act of war we gave this up as a concept as a people with the civil war because we pretty much stopped thinking of ourselves as a separate nation within a nation once the civil war happened because we then began to think about our citizenship rather than going back to africa or whatever so this becomes i think important to understand when you think about what's at stake for black people in all of this is is that African Americans need the police to call off its war on them. They have been at war with us for decades, since the 1860s. In every police department, wherever we are, check Google. I can show you the research if you want me to. Uh, you can look at the book called Something's in the Air, Race, Crime, and Marijuana Legalization by me and two other people. And you will see, we document how in every county in America, in every state in America, from Hawaii to Vermont, from Florida to Montana, Black people are overrepresented in the prisons in every state in America. The, the black prison population is higher than the black population everywhere in America. And nobody seems to know it, including Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, South Dakota, Hawaii. Blacks are overrepresented in prisons compared to their citizenship in the states. So in every state in America, this country as a whole has a whole bunch of black folk living as a captive nation within a nation. And if America is serious, it will do what the Panthers said in the 10 point plan. It will do what the black nation of Islam asked for. Let all the brothers out, not the rapists, not the murderers, not the ones who've done real harm to people, but all of those who deserve a second chance, who made mistakes, who, who should have been paroled and y'all won't parole them, who should be off probation so he can get it or she can get a second chance. She wants to go home to her children and y'all still got her in jail and then y'all mock us for our family situation? How demonic can it be? You mock our children for not having families the way you think they should be. But then you, you, ignore, you ignore all the research that says, where are the black men? Where are the mothers? One and a half million black men and women are in chains or under parole or, under, or on probation. Four million altogether. And we think it's just the police. We have to go after the prosecutors in every county. We have to go for the judges. We have to go after the Supreme Court. I'm serious. That's why reelecting, that's why Trump has to be beat because the next two up are Democrats. And that's who Trump gets to replace. And this stuff in the, will last in the 70, Supreme Court. In the Supreme this Court. This will last 70 years if Trump gets two more in. So this, this is life or death, people. If you're playing around, if you're in Cali, this is going to be blue, but you need to send your green money everywhere else in America. You need to be sending money and support and encouraging people in places where you got friends in Georgia, in Kentucky, in Louisiana, in Virginia, in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, in Wisconsin. You got friends in Milwaukee you ain't talked to. Email and say, hey, buddy, what's going on? Haven't talked to you in a few years. I need you to go vote. I did that to my old roommate, uh, a white dude in Denver, Colorado during the Obama run. I'm like, look, brother, I ain't talked to you in a minute, but I need you to get you and your family to vote for Obama. And I reached out to them, and I assume they did. My point is, we have, this is not about the election being won in 2020. This is about whether America takes a fatal turn 
to permanent apartheid again. And if I sound ridiculous to you for mentioning apartheid, because you think we don't have such a thing like they had in South Africa, that's because you've been brainwashed not to even recognize that Jim Crow was nothing but apartheid that lasted twice as long as South Africa's did. In fact, South Africa studied our Jim Crow system, just like the Nazis studied um, the, um, the um, not the Weimar Republic, but uh, the Nuremberg laws in order to uh, get, segregate them, the, Nazi, uh, the, the Jews in, 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 in Europe and in Germany. So the, 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 the Nazis and the Afrikaners studied American uh, segregation in order to implement their systems. So we are the mothership of, of apartheid. If I sound ridiculous, that America can't go apartheid again. You have to realize somebody 70 years old, somebody 60 years old right now in America, somebody 59 years old in America right now was under American apartheid in this lifetime. It was called Jim Crow, and that's what Martin Luther King was all about, getting rid of apartheid. So if you think that in two generations it can't swing back on us, you are ignoring the history of American presidential politics. It just takes one election, 1876, set black people back for 90 years the hayes tilden pre uh, uh, contest. You can look at other presidential contests um, where one person coming into power can be fatal. Ronald Reagan in 1980, fatal for black politics and reverses everything that King and the movement sought to establish. So be clear, Trump's intention is to erase the black presidency. The racist reaction he is and represents and embodies is about the black man and woman and family that was in the White House and not their policy positions. So Donald Trump um, sees himself as the, uh, the savior of the white race, um, the defender of the white faith. And I love it because black folk have been coming at him all along in every election, every um, midterm election, every uh, contested election, every uh, open election that they had to fill a seat. Black folk have been coming for Donald Trump like a roaring lion, fiercely. And now their children are out there in the streets chasing them into bunkers. And, and black folk impeached Donald Trump, two of them, two black um, uh, house managers. That was something that has never happened in history before that all of us ignored with uh, Hakeem Jeffers and Val Demings, two black house um, managers. Not one was a record, as far as I remember with Clinton. They didn't have one, but, or, or, say, or say Johnson. Uh, back in the 1860s. But to have two black house managers impeach the president, members of the Congressional Black Caucus, and then you still got people running around talking about the Congressional Black Caucus ain't doing nothing. Well, the Congressional Black Caucus was calling for the impeachment of Donald Trump on the night he got elected. And with Maxine Waters and Al Green, and everybody thought they were crazy. And, uh, and even all of all the little woke um, hotel uh, Addos militants now uh, were sleeping on that. When Maxine Waters did you say did, did you say Al Green? No, uh, uh, yeah, one of the congressmen, uh, is Congressman Al Green, he, not the singer he's, Al he's Green. He got all the hair okay. on his on his face, all this dark stuff going on. He got a he got a whole okay. little process. Well, I, I wanted you to I wanted you to make make that clear because I you know I know that he um, is singing. He's the singer, but we yeah. also have someone in Congress That's named it. Al That's Green. Well, folks, you guys can look these people up. You can look up their records. You can look up what Professor Taylor is talking about here on your own. I really do appreciate all of your information, Dr. Taylor. Uh, let me just, I wanna cover as much as uh, we can get to in, in this time that you have to spend with me. Um, so what about the census and how important is it for us to participate in the census? It's absolutely important. It's, that's where the money is. That's about money in your neighborhood. That's money for the schools. It's the way the Congress set up the system Every 10 years, everybody gets counted. Congressional seats get redistributed. So if people leave New York and move to Georgia, that population that moves from New York, let's say hypothetically all of it hypothetically moved to New York, then Georgia would get that apportionment of New York seats. So New York could lose two seats and Georgia could gain two seats if the population of New Yorkers had moved to Georgia in that 10 year period. So every 10 years, America reevaluates its population and where everybody's moving and wherever the most people are is where the money goes. And this is why it's important for black and brown people, red people, um, women people, poor people all over to respond. Stacey Abrams, the sister, is outstanding um, in this area. She's one of the major leaders. I can't remember her first name, but she's one of the major leaders in trying to educate everyday people of the importance of the census. Rappers need to get involved. Rappers need to get involved. Hip hop needs to get involved and tell young people through public service announcements, families, black families, 
put it in Spanish, put it in Korean, put it in different languages, tell people to count, because Alicia, we're at a tipping point of the census. The, one of my colleagues in San Francisco uh, wrote a book called The Browning of America, uh, Ron Sundstrom. That's where we are. Say so the name again. Ron Sundstrom, uh, and the book is called The Browning of America. It's a book in philosophy, but he's not looking at demographics as much as he's thinking about what that means. But the demographics of America are changing. In every congressional district right now, the white, the Latina birth rate is outperforming white women birth rates in every county in America. And that was 10 years ago. This is old research, I'm telling you. So, so, so there's a real uh, attrition in the white population and an explosion going on amongst others. And the census will tell you where everybody's moving. And then that's where the money goes for, 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 you know, for schools, for ambulatory services, for fire services, for you know, building inspections. Everything that we need as community that we are saying in this movement needs to come full-fledged, not in some piecemeal affirmative action or welfare policy, but in a total reversal of the relationship of Black people to the state. This is a part of that. This is America doing right by Black people because it's right to do right by them, the same way they've always done right by white people. White people have always had reparations. When they wake up in the day, the American state is on their side. That's how I define reparations. America, right. the government having your back. Right. Like FDIC, like FDIC government backed. And we need right. Black to be government backed in the same way the government is always back white. White people have been duped mm -hmm. by the American state into thinking that they're really superior. And now that they can see that they're not. And so the American state gave them a false sense of superiority for the past 100 years. And the truth is all coming out because we're not dying, we're growing. Anybody talking about black genocide is ignorant. We're going from 45 to 75 million before your children reach our age group. So, so that's where we're headed. Black people are exploding. The only people dying out and experiencing any kind of attrition or genocide is white population. And that's why we have to understand that we're going to see a lot of lurching out, a lot of violence, a lot of desperation, trying to hold on to the old thing. And then you're going to see another energy of young white people that you've seen now say, that's not going to happen. And I've been saying, the thing that Black folk have always needed is some white people to be revolutionary. I'm not talking about the SDS or some group of radicals like hippies and you know, Castro or in the 60s. I'm saying a generation of white people to be their own revolution. Every generation of white people have failed black people. Every generation they lie and promise us. They are the generation that will rid us of racism. And we've inherited for now 20 generations of white liars, 20 generations of white liars. And it's time for this generation to, to come correct because we're all too intelligent now. We're all too informed. We have the internet. People have access to information. People have knowledge. We have 10,000 Martin Luther Kings now. We have 10,000 Thurgood Marshalls now. We have 10,000 great accountants. We have, we have a black bourgeoisie and, and, uh, that, is, that is far expanded beyond what we had in the 60s. I don't mean to disrespect those people. They were all special. But my point is, we have 10,000 great lawyers now. We have you know, Thurgood Marshall and Charles Houston and a few others here and there, Constance Baker and a few others here and there. But overall, now that was in a, a cadre of maybe 50 people. I'm saying now we got 25,000 uh, 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 Thurgood Marshalls. Where are they? And why aren't they stepping up to challenge the laws in every district? I'm sorry, Alicia. I think every black organization, the, e the engineers, the political scientists, the sociologists, the economists, um, the anthropologists, um, the health professionals, the law enforcement professionals, we should all be rising up with the young people in the streets in our professions. This has to be a massive, y'all can't go back to normal, we're not letting y'all go back to normal, black reaction in America. That's in every it. office in America, we have to tell them, no, you cannot be who you used to be. Y'all got to right. change, because we're tired of y'all. And that's, that's the it. truth. Black that's people it. think of white people and their violence and their racism. We don't call the police on them. We don't shoot them running down the street in the middle of the day. They, we don't break into their beds and kill their daughters at night. We don't do the damage that they do to our people. We don't do to them. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying, black people are in a condition, but we don't need to change. Our condition needs to change. White people need to change as a people, and they don't got no condition other than the mental one of being uh, tricked by their own government into thinking that they were naturally superior when all along it was the reparations that the state was giving them every time they woke up white and they didn't have to deal with redlining. They didn't have to deal with ghettos. They didn't have to deal with occupied, being occupied by the police. They didn't have to deal with bad education, bad food, and all of these kinds of things. So when you start talking about where we are as a people, 
with law enforcement reform, yes, we need to take as much of that money as possible, billions of it, and redistribute it to the neighborhoods and to the schools and to the families. Absolutely. Because listen to this. Most of you will think I'm crazy if I say America should give every black child when he's born $400,000. And that will guarantee that child's life will be beautiful. Guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pretty much what white kids get from their mamas and daddies having a 100-year advantage over us. They get that 400. Mm -hmm. But the same, but, and all of the white people, liberals, conservative, and radicals, the real radicals, oh yeah, the, the, the Marxists, they're so full of, you know what? Um, it's for You know, because what, what, what the reality is, is they are willing to only see black people suffer. They're not willing to see us liberated. They want to they wanna join us in solidarity in our black suffering. But none mm -hmm. of them come up with an economic program for our people. They just want to tear down buildings for us and do graffiti. Well, I don't need you, white boy, to do to, to tear down a, a 14th and Broadway. I need you to talk to your mama and your daddy and the people in the, in, the, in the banking industry and in the financing industry and in the insurance industry to stop discriminating against everyday people like they don't against your people. See, that's, that's what reparations is. Reparations is you wake up white and the government provides protections in everything you do and eat and sleep all day, you got, it has your back. And, and reparations is that the government was keeping blacks and reds and, and browns and, and, and Asians down while it was artificially overdeveloping the white group. And now the white group is in trouble because the American state can't keep buttressing this sense of uh, superiority because the truth is out. They ain't let me ask you, nobody. let me, and this, this makes me think about the, uh, 2008 burst of the bubble, the economic uh, shift uh, when those white uh, dollars all of a sudden uh, like came up missing or short or deficient. Were they actually like robbing themselves, taking from themselves, like grabbing all that they could that really didn't even belong to them? But, and was actually, you know, owed to China. Okay, it was money they should have been paying back to China, but instead they decided to rob and take off and go offshore somewhere with right. the dollars. Right. Is that when things really started to shift when we went through that crisis, that economic Absolutely. crisis? Yeah, this is all a, continua a continuation of it. If you want to, you know, try to isolate it in some way, that's one thing. But the truth mm -hmm. is, it is more of a, you know, we're only, a, what, that was 28? This is in, in 209, and we're in 2020. So yeah, the, the ramifications, especially for black communities, was permanent. People lost permanent wealth, generational wealth, uh, in places like the DMV over in the, in the uh, DC area. A, whole, a lot of wealth was lost in black communities around the country. And they were trying to get back on track, but we still are so far behind. We're decades behind average white people in terms of home ownership measurements of wealth alone. Forget private investment and things of that sort. Only the, you know, the ones that have been lucky enough to understand that game have got into yeah. it. But those of us who are using the old ways of American middle class and dream, because that's all the dream was, that's all Martin Luther King's dream was, was to be able to live a middle class life in mm -hmm. America. And that was the magic of America. Well, but it seems life, like for, for white America, that economic time was really a time when I first, for the first time, saw them panicking and worrying. And I said to myself, well, what did y'all do with the money? Like, yeah. what did y'all do with the money? Because yeah. I sure didn't have it. Right. I'm not worried about it. I'm, I'm still <laughs> poor. That's but right. what was it that y'all did with your yeah. money yeah. to the point where now you are worried, crying out and and coming into our neighborhoods, trying to gentrify, try to do desperate, desperate yep. measures. Yep, yep. I mean, I, I remember uh, Leon Panetta's granddaughter was going to my, was in my son's fifth grade class. And, and this is Leon Panetta, the head of the CIA and the, and the Defense Department. His granddaughter was going to public school because it, here where I live in Oakland, uh, up in these hills is where half the UC systems professors and administrators live and all these affluent white folk. They could not afford to send their kids to the private schools like, uh, you know, these private schools. So they sent them to Montclair or to the, you know, good public schools. And that was, that was one of the original uh, outcomes of the 08 crisis. But we really have not gotten back. Only certain industries have come back. But the, the people, black wealth certainly has not recovered if you look at, say, the Urban League's annual report of the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the state of black America. We, we, we went backwards. And that's why I think things like Juneteenth 
and any kind of cultural expression, the unity of our politics is something we just don't recognize, but we stick together in politics like no other area of life. We stick together in the 90, 90 percentile ratings. What, where, where else do black people do that? Maybe going mm -hmm. to church, but we have the Baptist, Methodist, Seventh-day Adventist churches, right? So we, even if we're Christians, we're all different kinds. But in politics, the, the gay black, the LGBTQ black, the, 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 the black homophobe, um, well, that's probably not true. They're probably in the conservative party. But generally speaking, every formulation of black person, ideologically, on a continuum, um, is represented um, in, in, in this. And that's something that I think that is underappreciated, that Black folk accept the most racist element, unite in politics. And, and that's only at the national and presidential politics, because we don't do a good job of midterm organizing as a people. And that's which, that should be our main strategy. When the white folk ain't paying attention is when the minorities should mobilize. And that would be the midterm elections. When they, their turnout is low, we should turn out high. And that way we can affect the momentum going into the 2020 election. And that's what black folk have done right now that nobody's recognizing. Since 2018, since the night oh, Donald Trump lost the popular vote and won the electoral college, Donald Trump lost by 3 million votes that night. Black men and women were at the tipping point of that. Then on the midterm of November 18, black folk were at the tipping point of minus 8 million votes for Donald Trump. So minus 11 million votes since Donald Trump became president is a result of black people. And they're coming at him at every possible way through violence, through chasing him into a bunker, through impeaching him, through grassroots movements, through rap music, through everything and and when when donald trump is voted out of office in in about five months it will be black people who saved america and it will be black people who saved democracy because black people understand democracy is at stake and only white people are laughing at trump still only white people think this is a re reality tv show that's all fun we got corona killing our people mm. disproportionately and this dude talking about it's over and it's worse now than it's ever been at any point and if they forgive him for this in november then we as a people, um, I, think, I think something's got to give in a real, real ugly way if they reelect Donald Trump. I think black folk have to tear this thing down. I do. Tell me like, about- like, uh, like they did last week. They, they'll have to do that again in November because white people have to understand black people are no longer are willing to let you kill us. I don't think there will be another cop. Another cop will not be able to do to another black man what that cop did to uh, um, Mr. George, I hope. I know for sure, if I see it from now on, if I see that kind of abuse, they're gonna to have to put me in prison. And most people were afraid of that, but that is how they get away with it, is citizens mm -hmm. you know, allowing it. And fortunately in that yeah. scene, the citizens are right there confronting them and they still murdered him, even as a young white woman and black man were, were telling him, you're killing him. So, that, so in some ways, you, know, you can still have everything right. And, 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 and you know, at that level, you still have um, yeah. people go across the line. So, so what about voter suppression now? Is that going to be something that we need to really be concerned about? And how does voter suppression happen? And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, may, okay, the, the mail-in ballot is one way to avoid it. And, and then maybe voting online is another way. I mean, what about voter suppression and alternatives to it? Yeah, this is going to have to come from Nancy Pelosi and Congress. Throw a lot of money at mail-in voting around the country, ignore Donald Trump's stupid talk. Um, there's no voter fraud in the national level of government in America. So I think, you know, this voter suppression is basically the only way the Republicans can be competitive. In 2000, they needed the Electoral College. In 2004, they were said to have cheated with Glover, uh, the Secretary of State in Ohio. And then in 2016, Donald Trump lost by 3 million votes in a record defeat. That's what nobody knows. This Hillary Clinton beat him in a record defeat uh, in the popular vote. So I think, you know, black folk have been doing an outstanding job. And, and on one part, Alicia, I think we as a people in our own conversations internally and community have to say to each other like our ancestors did, we gotta go buy the same jar, we gotta go buy the same jelly beans that these devils are gonna use at us at the poll and just count them. So you gotta outsmart them. And this is what Stacey Abrams is saying, is we have to outperform the racism. We gotta turn out in such a massive way that there's, there's no doubt about it. It cannot be close, because you know this idiot and his minions will try to make more out of it. You know, like Al Gore punked out in 2000, in my opinion, and gave it to Bush, and that was frustrating. And if, 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 and, and fortunately, Biden's already saying Donald Trump wants to cheat, 
and the new book that came out yesterday with Bolton said that Donald Trump is basically begging of Chairman Xi in China to help him win. So all of the alarm systems are up for Donald Trump's cheating. But we as the people have to understand that we have to outperform the obstruction, outperform the voter suppression. So that means getting our elders out. That means, like we saw recently in Houston, we got to stand out there longer. That's the, the racism of voting is something that black people experience every time we vote. We wait three, four, five hours. There's a documentary by Stacey Abrams about what happened in, uh, when they stole her election, and it was mm -hmm. stolen by Kemp in Georgia, and the ways in which everyday black people and college campuses, too, where young white people will vote you know, liberally and progressively are also frustrated with these ID issues and just making it very difficult as opposed to very easy. In the white community, they have too many votes. They be tripping over each other, going to, to polls right next door to each other. In the African-American community or in the democratic places, they get um, you know, dispersed. And that's why it's so important for people to understand that the 2020 election is about everything from the top to the bottom and changing. The change happens at the bottom with the, like you were talking about earlier, the census. That also becomes a part of the redistricting and the redrawing of electoral maps. And when it's done unfairly, in states, it's called gerrymandering. And yeah. in California, that's unconstitutional and we have remedies for it, like um, open primaries and voter, you know, voter, voter um, choice uh, type voting. Um, but to deal with this problem of fraud, the good thing is, Alicia, we have 50 different American systems in 50 different states with 50 different rules, 50 different secretaries of state setting policies. So no one thing can cheat all 50 things. That's the thing, that's the beauty of America, is it's so spread out. And, and, and then you gotta think about places like Arkansas and Louisiana and Mexico that are poor, they can't even afford you know, the paper for an old fashioned pencil and paper ballot. I may be borrowing the paper from the people coming to vote. Can we borrow the paper so y'all can vote? That's how bad they got it. So, wow. so that, you know, so this kind of thing that the Chinese or the Russians can affect actual vote numbers, it's not possible because they would have to be able to do it in 50 different places at, at, at the state, federal and county level. It would take an Einstein brain to do it. And they just don't have the, the wherewithal to do it. Um, and so what about the electoral college? Yeah, the Electoral College right now, um, it needs to be um, made obsolete simply by states like Oklahoma and New Hampshire do right now, where they don't give all to the winner. They apportion out who wins. So if you win the Electoral College of New Hampshire, one person gets one and the other person gets, you know, two. Uh, if they, they say, let's say the winner gets two and the loser gets one. So the winner doesn't take all. So that way you don't have this kind of, you can do that in all 50 states. And eventually that will mean the Electoral College loses all of its effective power and you don't even have to try to get it amended. You don't have to try to get it changed by Congress. You can do it at the state legislature level, at the ground level. The problem is you got red America and blue America, so the racist half of it will never cooperate. And that's why we've always been held back as a people is there are things in place that could bring about our liberation, but we have these demons who as a people um, have always been against us um, and have never forgiven us for them enslaving us. That's how sick they are. They have never forgiven um, us for us being enslaved. Um, because again, whenever white people see us, we remind them of who they are as a people historically. And no matter how much they tell themselves they're Einstein and, and Marx and uh, you know, uh, you know, someone like Freud and you know, Mozart and you know, Handel and all of these other things that represent high European culture, this right here, this is proof of their crime, this. And as long as they see this, right. they, will it. they will never be able to be whole until they forgive themselves for their evil. Because we already showed them how they can be forgiven. We forgive them when we should not forgive them. And I think we're at a point now where black people are saying to America, y'all don't have much more time. We're willing to go down, but we can't keep living like this. Because okay. Alicia, the reality is with the browning of America, you cannot have a white supremacist law enforcement system that was cut in the 1860s, mainly on black people and a black and a non-white majority in the country going forward. And that's what we're going to have. We're going to have a non-white majority in about 120 years, but definitely by the next 70. So you really by the next 50 and, and over that next 70, over that, you know, that time period. In about yeah. 150 years, Alicia, the census suggests White people will be such a minority that we won't even know that they're here. They might go back to Europe. You might see a famous white person be 
the last Colum like Columbus was the first that they say that there might be an un-Columbus one day in about 150 years because that's what the census is showing us yeah. right now so my point yeah. to you is a white supremacist law enforcement apparatus that was created in the 19th century cannot coexist with a black and non-white majority going forth in the 21st century one of these yeah. things got to give and black folk are saying right now it ain't gonna be us we're gonna break it and that's what we're doing right now and we are going to break it the last subject is a local issue here mm -hmm. with i guess it's intimidation with the nooses that have been placed in the oak trees at lake merritt in oakland just yeah. talk a little bit about intimidation and how we're going to see it and you know how we need to be uh moving and dealing with the intimidation that will come yeah. I, I just did a report a minute ago and apparently these were not black white kids that did the ropes so we call them nooses but they were more like ropes that they were using for some sort of exercise high up in a tree and just left them there and so people looked up probably a white person said oh noose lynching because black folk would look up and said oh this is some stupid some stupid rope up there i'm telling you because even right now right. libby shaft is all up in arms calling for a federal investigation these were black boys or or at least not white boys whoever they were they were mixed race boys typical oakland kids mixed race is oakland and so that's who did this right i had an incident at my school last semester where a young man i can't say too much because i'm on a, a certain committee but a young man created a, a fiercely intense incident where he threatened other students lives with violence, with guns. And he had been emailing them and harassing them and harassing them and threatening him and talking about killing them. And then one night he went outside the dorms and was screaming, it's all on, it was all on video. They, he was screaming this fierce violence. You niggas come out of here, I want you. Well, it turned out to be a boy who was black with a white mama, dealing with his own racial chaos in his own tortured self. Much like Candace Owens is a tortured black girl who got called the dirty nigger, and that's why she's so messed up. She can never heal herself. And so you see these kinds of reactions. So this, so what Libby Schaff and everyone else is reacting to may have been these mixed race boys playing with these ropes, just being weird Oakland in Oakland. But because white folk are hypersensitive now, because they're waking up to these issues, they're reading racism and everything. Okay. Uh, in ways that black folk, they accuse black folk of. So I'm saying to you, the fact that black people did not have massive reaction in marches uh, at the lake yesterday, let you know that they understood there was a nuance to it, that these weren't white boys, this wasn't a race thing, it was a misunderstanding or a false alarm. But then this morning, some idiot racist does indeed hang a large human-sized black-headed mannequin from a tree in Oakland, and this is racism, and now the black community will respond. The black community did not respond to the nooses yesterday, the, the, the rope, I'm calling ropes, the ropes right. yesterday, because although I saw one or two people on Facebook talking about what they were going to do, just people, you know, running their mouths, the black community did not respond. I didn't see any massive response. But we have a precedent when the, the so-called uh, barbecue Becky called, right. that was Oakland. What right. was the black reaction? They had a 5-1 old day. They had 30,000 black people come within a week and take over the lake and say, this is still ours, I'm from here. And black folk from Oakland said, you white people, y'all need to take that stuff back to wherever you came from, but this is still ours. And black Oakland marked its territory with the cookout incident. Yesterday, okay. the black community did not react only a few people did. Typically, the people that get on and are the spokespersons for everything, you know, just yeah. reiterate their importance in speaking to these things. But the reality is the black community, from what I was able to detect, did not go out in mass. But I think now that they had this second thing happen this morning with this mannequin, now the black community is going to make a statement to say, you have no power here. You, you know, you can, you can try to terrorize people and haunt them and, and make them afraid, but this is Oakland. And ain't nobody scared of you in Oakland. The Klan was here with 20,000 Klan members met up in these hills where I am right now in the, in the 1900s. Black Oakland ain't scared of these white folk. Go on over to East Oakland if you bad. Go to West Oakland and see and see what come and see what don't come back out. So ain't nobody scared of these white people. They attacked they attack Neil Wilson at the West Oakland BART on the fringes of the white community and the marketplace. But I'd be damned if they had done that in, in, in deep Oakland, because that white man would have never made it out. Um, somebody would have grabbed him. So and so we've even had one of the young girls of our community here in Oakland, Neil Wilson, stabbed in the neck by a racist, her and her sister, and, and she was killed um, in, in West Oakland. And I want you all never to forget Neil Wilson's name. Neil Wilson, 
should be mentioned with everybody else. She was stabbed in the neck by a racist and at the West Oakland Bar, she and her sister, her sister survived. And she was coming from the memorial of her boyfriend who had drowned a year earlier in Memorial Day um, in, the, in the pond here in the Bay Area mm -hmm. when she was killed. Well, Dr. Uh, and Professor of USF at uh, the Department of Politics, uh, Dr. James Taylor, thank you so much for joining me here. The shouts for justice and police reform are ringing out in the streets and our nation, our people continue to gather in solidarity to root out the racism and the injustice. And I appreciate you coming on to talk about it, to be a part of it, and to keep the, these ideas and subjects and, and realities uh, at the forefront of all of our lives. Let, let, Much love and appreciation. Let's, let's do it again. Let's do, okay. it until, let's do it until we are sure that this man is not allowed to get back in, in, in office. He needs to be out of the office. And we need to educate people as much as possible of providing information so they can understand this is life or death. This ain't about 2020. This is about America setting black people back another 100 years if he is reelected. You and I won't let that happen. That's right. Thank you. So thank you again. And thank you to all of you for joining us here for another episode of Clarity Conversations. I'm Alicia Mayo. Thank you.